a Greek giant who steals fire from the sun and shares it with mankind. A box, when open, releases terrible things like pain, worry, and sadness into the world. What are these stories? Well, hi there, Bead of Adventure, and welcome to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today we are going to learn about the ancient gods of Greek mythology, who, although powerful, <laughs> were not always kind. From the story of Prometheus and how fire was given to men. Let's get started. The story of Prometheus how fire was given to men. In those old, old times, there lived two brothers who were not like other men, nor yet like the mighty ones who lived upon the mountaintop. They were the sons of one of those giant titans who had fought against Zeus and had been sent in chains to the strong prison house in the lower world. The name of the elder of these brothers was Prometheus, or Forethought. For he was always thinking of the future and making things ready for what might happen tomorrow or next week or next year or maybe in a hundred years to come. The younger brother was called Epimetheus or afterthought for he was always so busy thinking of yesterday or last year or a hundred years ago that he had no care at all for what might come to pass after a while. For some cause, Zeus had not sent these brothers to prison with the rest of the Titans. Prometheus did not care to live among the clouds on the mountaintop with the gods. He was too busy for that. While the mighty folk were spending their time in idleness, drinking nectar and eating ambrosia, he was intent upon plans for making the world wiser and better than it had ever been before. He went out amongst the men to live with them and help them, for his heart was filled with sadness when he found that they were no longer happy as they had been during the golden age when Saturn was king. Ah, how very poor and wretched they were. He found them living in caves and in, in holes in the earth, shivering with cold because there was no fire, dying of starvation, hunted by wild beasts and by one another the most miserable of all living creatures. If they only had fire, said Prometheus to himself, they could at least warm themselves and cook their food. And after a while, they could learn to make tools and build themselves houses. Without fire, well, they're worse off than the beasts. Then he went boldly to Zeus and begged him to give fire to men so that they may have a little comfort through the long, dreary, months of winter. Not a spark will I give, said Zeus. No, indeed. Why, if men had fire, they might become strong and wise like ourselves. And after a while, they might drive us out of the kingdom. Let them shiver with gold and let them live like beasts. It is best for them to be poor and ignorant so that we mighty ones may thrive and be happy. Prometheus made no answer, but he had set his heart on helping mankind, and he did not give up. He turned away and left Zeus and his mighty company forever. As he was walking by the shore of the sea, he found a reed, or some say a tall stalk of fennel growing. And when he had broke it off, he saw that its hollow center was filled with dry, soft pith which would burn slowly and keep on fire for a long, long time. He took the long stalks in his hands and started with it towards the dwelling of the sun in the far east. Mankind shall have fire in spite of that tyrant that sits on the mountaintop, he said. He reached the place of the sun in the early morning, just as the glowing golden orb was rising from the earth and beginning his daily journey through the sky. He touched the end of the long reed to the flames and whoosh, the dry pith caught on fire and burned slowly. 
Then he turned and hastened back to his own land, carrying with him the precious spark hidden in the hollow center of the plant. He called some of the shivering men from their caves and built a huge fire for them and showed them how to warm themselves by it and how to build other fires from the coals. Soon, there was a cheerful blaze in every home in the land. The men and women gathered round it and were warm and happy and thanked Prometheus for the wonderful gift which he'd brought to them from the sun. It was not long until they learned to cook their food and so to eat like men instead of like beasts. They began at once to leave off their wild and savage habits and instead of lurking in the dark places of the world, they came out into the open air and the bright sunlight and were glad because life had been given to them. After that, Prometheus taught them, little by little, a thousand things. He showed them how to build houses of wood and stone and how to tame sheep and cattle and make them useful. He taught them how to plow and sow and reap and how to protect themselves from the storms of winter and the beasts of the woods. Then he showed them how to dig in the earth for copper and iron and how to melt the ore and how to hammer it into shape and fashion from it tools and weapons which they needed in times of peace and war. And when he saw how happy the world was becoming, he cried out, A new golden age shall come, brighter and better than the one before. Things might have gone on, very happily indeed, and the golden age might really have come again, had it not been for Zeus. But one day he chanced to look down upon the earth, and he saw the fires burning and the people living in houses, and the flocks feeding on the hills, and the grain ripening in the fields. And this made him angry. Who has done all of this? he asked. And someone answered, Prometheus. What? That young titan? he cried. Well, I will punish him in a way that will make him wish I had shut him up in the prison with his kinfolk. But as for these puny men, let them keep their fire. I will make them ten times more miserable than they were before they had it. Of course, it would be easy enough to deal with Prometheus at any time. And so Zeus was in no great haste about that. He made up his mind to distress mankind first. And he thought of a plan for doing it in a very strange roundabout way. In the first place, he ordered his blacksmith, Vulcan, whose forge was in a big crater in a burning mountain to take a lump of clay, which he gave to him, and mold it into the form of a woman. Vulcan did as he was bidden, and when he had finished the image, he carried it up to Zeus, who was sitting among the clouds with all the mighty folk around him. It was nothing but a mere lifeless body, but the great blacksmith had given it a form more perfect than that of any other statue that had ever been made. Come now, said Zeus, let us all give some goodly gift to this woman. And he began by giving her life. Then the others came in their turn, each with a gift for the marvelous creature. One gave her beauty, and another a pleasant voice, and another good manners, and another a kind heart, and another skill in many of the arts, and lastly, one gave her curiosity. Then they called her Pandora, which means the all gifted, because she had received gifts from them all. Pandora was so beautiful and so wondrously gifted that no one could help but loving her. When the mighty folk had admired her for a time, they gave her to Mercury, the light-footed, and he led her down the mountainside to the place where Prometheus and his brother were living and toiling for the good of mankind. He met Epimetheus first and said to him, Epimetheus! Here is a beautiful woman whom Zeus has sent to be your wife. Prometheus had often warned his 
brother to beware of any gift that Zeus might send, for he knew that the mighty tyrant could not be trusted. But when Epimetheus saw Pandora, how lovely and wise and kind she was, he forgot all the warnings and took her home to live with him and to be his wife. Pandora was very happy in her new home, and even Prometheus, when he saw her, was pleased with her loveliness. She had brought with her a golden casket, which Zeus had given her at parting, and which, he had told her, held many precious things. But wise Athena, queen of the air, and goddess of wisdom, had warned her to never, never open it and look at the things inside. They must be jewels, she said to herself, and then she thought of how they would add to her beauty if only she could wear them. Why did Zeus give them to me if I should never use them or even so much as look at them, she wondered. The more she thought about the golden casket, the more curious she was to see what was in it. And every day she took it down from its shelf and felt the lid and tried to peer inside it without opening it. Why should I care what Athena has told me, she said at last. She's not beautiful, and jewels would be of no use to her. I think that I will look at them, at any rate. Athena will never know. Nobody else will ever know. So, she opened the lid a very little, just to peep inside, and all at once there was a whirring rustling sound, and before she could shut it down again, out flew 10,000 strange creatures with death-like faces and gaunt and dreadful forms, such as nobody in the world had ever seen. They fluttered for a little bit around the room and then flew away to find dwelling places wherever there were homes of men. They were diseases and cares for up to that time, mankind had not had any kind of sickness, nor felt any troubles of the mind, nor worried about what the morrow might bring forth. These creatures flew into every house, and without anyone seeing them, nestled down into the bosoms of men and women and children, and put an end to all their joy. And ever since that day, they've been flitting and creeping unseen and unheard all over the land, bringing pain and sorrow and death into every household. If Pandora had not shut down the lid so quickly, things would have gone much worse. But she closed it just in time to keep the last of the evil creatures out. The name of this creature was Foreboding. And although he was almost half out of the casket, Pandora pushed him back down and shut the lid so tight that he could never escape. If he had gone out into the world, men would have known from childhood just what troubles, every trouble were gonna come to them every day of their lives. And they would never have had any kind of joy or hope for as long as they lived. And this was the way in which clever Zeus sought to make mankind more miserable than they had been before Prometheus befriended them. The next thing that Zeus did was to punish Prometheus for stealing the fire. He bade two of his servants, whose names were Strength and Force, to seize the bold Titan giant and carry him to the topmost peak of a mountain. Then he sent the blacksmith, Vulcan, to bind him with iron chains and fetter him to the rocks so that he could not move hand or foot. Vulcan did not like to do this, for he was a friend of Prometheus, and yet he did not dare disobey Zeus. And so the great friend of man, who had given them fire and lifted them out of their wretchedness and shown them how to live, was chained to a mountain peak. And there he hung with the storm winds whistling always about him and the pitiless hail beating against his face and the fierce eagles shrieking in his ears and tearing at his body with their cruel claws. Yet, he bore all his sufferings with not even a groan and never would he beg for mercy or say that he was sorry for what he had done to help man. Year after year, 
and age after age, Prometheus hung there. Now and then old Helios, the driver of the sun car, would look down upon him and smile. And now and then flocks of birds would bring him messages from faraway lands. And once, the ocean nymphs came and sang wonderful songs in his hearing. And oftentimes men looked up to him with pitying eyes and cried out against the tyrant Zeus who had placed him there. Then, once upon a time, a white cow passed that way. A strangely beautiful cow with large sad eyes and a face that seemed almost human. She stopped and looked up at the cold gray peak and at the giant body which was chained there. Prometheus saw her and spoke to her kindly. <laughs> I know who you are, he said. You are Io, who was once a fair and happy maiden in distant Argos. And now, because of the tyrant Zeus and his jealous wife, you are doomed to wander from land to land in that unhuman form. But do not lose hope. Go on southward and then to the west, and after many days, you shall come to the great river Nile. There, you shall again become a maiden, but fairer and more beautiful than before. And you shall become the wife of the king of that land, and shall give birth to a son from whom shall spring the hero that will break my chains and set me free. As for me, I bide in patience the day which not even Zeus can hasten or delay. Farewell. Poor Io would have spoken back, but she could not, for she was a cow. Her sorrowful eyes looked once more at the suffering hero on the peak. And then she turned and began her long and tiresome journey to the land of the Nile. Ages passed, and at last a great hero, whose name was Hercules, came to the land and the mountaintop. In spite of Zeus's dreadful thunderbolts and fearful storms of snow and sleet, he climbed the ragged mountain peak. He slew the fierce eagles that had so long tormented the helpless prisoner on those craggy heights. And with a mighty blow, whoosh, he broke the iron chains of Prometheus and set the grand old hero free. <laughs> I knew you would come said Prometheus. Ten generations ago, I spoke of you to Io, who was afterwards the queen of the land of Nile. And Io, said Hercules, was the mother of the race from which I am sprung. And that is the story of Prometheus and how man came to have fire. Wow! What an amazing story of generosity and punishment. Poor Prometheus, I'm so happy he finally got free. For other myths from different cultures, check out these videos with talking animals, dragons, and adventures. <laughs> and until our next video, happy story time. <laughs>